Well, welcome. I'm really glad that you are joining us online for our podcast. My name is Joel, and I am the pastor here at Paris Community Church. As, as a church, we are for Paris, which, which means that, that we want to be for our community. We want to be for you because we believe that God is for us as well. If you're looking for the full service, you can jump back to our YouTube channel and you can get songs and prayers included as well. One of the things that we really value as a church is building community. And we, we're so excited you took this first step of connecting with us. If you'd like to connect with us a little bit more, may I suggest you sign up for our e-blast. You can, you can jump onto our website, you can click on the link, and within 15 seconds, you'll be signed up. And what the e-blast does is it provides you more information around things that are happening or have happened in the life of our church. It's also a means of us to communicate back and forth a little bit more. Oftentimes I give additional content and, and thoughts around uh, the weekly teaching. But we're glad that you join us. We hope this is helpful. We hope that this builds hope. We hope this creates a space for you to encounter more of God with you in the midst of wherever you are in life or in faith. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. I'm uh, really glad that you are joining us uh, today online. Uh, my name is Joel and I am the pastor of Paris Community Church. And whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube or more recently on Rogers TV, we are glad that you are connecting with us in this way. We're actually into week two of a series called For Paris, being a church for our community. And maybe for some of you are wondering, like, what what is the deal with four pairs? Like, what, what does that actually mean? What is it all about? Is it just like a catchy phrase? For us, four pairs is really at the heart of what we want to be as a church. We believe that God is for you. And so as a church, we want to be for you as well. We want to get in your corner and make a difference. At the end of the day, as a church, we want to see lives transformed. We want to see our communities impacted for good. And we believe, how do we do that? is by being for you, by, by leading you towards Jesus, the one who changes absolutely everything. And so for us, this series kind of gets at the heart of what does this start to look like for you and for me? How do, we, how do we begin to make a difference in the lives of the people that we know? How do we begin to make a difference in, in the communities in which we live? Now, Ryan kicked off the series last week by, by reminding us that following Jesus' resurrection, Jesus went to his disciples and says, you're going to be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, not only in Samaria, not only in Judea, but to the ends of the world. Like, that's a pretty daunting ask when you think of it, because at the time, there was only about 120 of them in the first place. And so what does that start to look like? I think oftentimes when we think of our own lives, when we think of the ministries we're involved in, maybe sometimes we can be overwhelmed. Maybe we can be intimidated and we can begin to wonder, well, how can I make a difference? How, how can I be for my community or for my family or for my colleagues? Today, I want to land at a place that has been a game changer for me, that, that is so simple, so subtle can be so easily missed, but I believe is the starting point of how we begin to make a difference. How, how if we truly want to be for others, we need to be aware of this, of how God often gets our attention. And to put it simply, it starts with a nudge. A, a nudge is so subtle. A nudge is so simple. It's not a, it's not a shove, but it's, it's something that gets your attention. Gets you noticing something that maybe you wouldn't have noticed on your own. Perhaps brings you to a place that, that you wouldn't have stepped into initially. And I think oftentimes when you start to read the Bible, one of the dangers is we jump to the end of the story and we see the amazing things that are happening and we fail to see how it all began with a nudge. As I think of our church, as I think of our ministries, as I think of the impact that we're having, oftentimes, if not every time, it began by God nudging individuals to step into a certain direction. And so I want to turn to a passage in the Bible, and, and I want you to start to realize how it started with a nudge, how, how, how Jesus' desire to reach the ends of the earth started with a nudge, a conversation that put in motion some incredible things. I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 
8. And to give you a bit of a background, this is following the resurrection where Jesus' disciples, his followers, are now going and, and sharing the good news. Some are in Jerusalem. And in this particular case, this guy by the name of Philip is doing ministry in the region of Samaria. And, and things are going incredibly well. There are miracles being performed. People are asking questions about Jesus. People are actually being baptized. People are coming to faith in Jesus. Like the community is being impacted for good. Lives are being transformed. And then God nudges Philip to do something else, which at first kind of seems rather odd. I mean, why would God pull Philip out of the great work in Samaria? to go to a different place. Well, let's, let's read the passage, let's, let's unpack it for our understanding, and then land at the place of, what does this mean for you and for me? If we wanna be for others, how do nudges begin to play out in our life? And so I'm gonna to turn to Acts chapter eight, beginning in verse 26, and this is what we read. It says, as for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Kondike, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, how can I, unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me. Was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop. And they went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. Here is yet another, another instance where, where a nudge produced an incredible reality, how a life was completely transformed. But, but the challenge is too often we go to the end of the story and we fail to see how it all began with a nudge. Did you pick up on them as, as I was reading along? The, the, the first nudge was, was when Philip was in ministry in Samaria and he was told by an angel of the Lord, he was nudged by God to go to a desert road. Like, don't, don't run past that too quickly. Like, like, how odd is that? Like, Philip was engaged in ministry, active ministry, lives being changed and transformed. And suddenly he's told to go walk down a desert, hot, dirty, dusty road. Like, like, like really? Why? But remarkably and thankfully, Philip listened. I don't know, we're not told. Philip must have been walking down the road being like, what, what on earth is going on? When suddenly a chariot appeared with a man that he had never met from a culture he didn't know, an Ethiopian who had been worshiping in Jerusalem and was now returning home. He, he was trying to understand more of who God was. And the second nudge was go walk beside the carriage. Now, that could have been awkward. Like, wait a second, what, what, you want me to go walk beside the carriage? Like, like what's the guy gonna think? Like, what is I going, what am I going to say? But here we start to see how because Philip was obedient, how he responded to the nudges and the promptings of God, something incredible started to happen. It wasn't, it wasn't a coincidence. Wouldn't you know it, this man was reading from the scriptures. He was trying to understand what he was reading. And so Philip asked him, do, do you understand what it is you're reading? And the guy's like, I have no idea I, unless someone explains it to me. There's a hint of frustration that he had gone to Jerusalem to worship, but, but clearly he wasn't understanding. He wasn't getting it. And what an opportunity. And so Philip met him where he was at, stepped into the carriage, and began to use where he was starting from, 
as a means of leading him towards Jesus. And in their brief encounter, this man's life was changed. His life was transformed. He was baptized. Remember Jesus' words, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the world. That's what Philip was doing. Scholars believe that the movement of Christianity into, Phil into, into Ethiopia likely began through this conversation. Now, it's so easy for us to jump to the end of the story and think, well, how did it make a difference? How did the good news of Jesus get into these other countries? How, how did they start to know that God was for them? I believe, I believe it's by people like Philip responding to a nudge. Maybe not necessarily understanding it right away. Maybe not simply getting why God was doing it, but they were following in obedience. You see, I believe one of the keys to the success of a nudge is not the ultimate outcome. Because oftentimes we have no idea what God is doing or what God is going to do but it's rather responding in obedience. Think of your own life. So often God will prompt us, God will nudge us in a subtle, simple way. Don't, don't begin to ask the question, well, 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 what is this going to turn into and how successful is this going to be? Will you simply be faithful with the way in which God is nudging you? I recently returned from being in Malawi. In addition to what I do here at the church, I'm involved in overseeing a prison ministry. A prison ministry that, that now incorporates 22 prisons in the southern part of Malawi. We come in contact with about 5,000 inmates, men and women, and children every single month. It's, it's, it, it's a ministry that, that wants to bring this good news of Jesus. It's, it's a ministry that is about being for the men and women in prisons. And so we provide Bible study, we provide one-on-one -on -one counseling, we provide prayer. We also bring in basic necessities like, like soap and, and medicine and clothing. We want them to know that God is for them. And so our ministry is for them as well. Now, as I look back and I think how God has grown this ministry, I never forget at how it all began with a nudge. In 2005, I was working in a church and I was given the opportunity to go and to speak in the local prison. And while I couldn't be there every Sunday, I, I showed up on this one particular Sunday and, and, I, I, and I felt a nudge from God to say something. And so I simply said, listen, I can't be with you every week on a Sunday, but if there's anything that I can do, please let me know. I, kind of almost a throwaway sentence. Two days later, one of the guards from the prisons arrived at my house with a handwritten letter from some of the inmates asking me to come and teach them the Bible. And so I started to go every Tuesday morning for the next couple of years until I returned to Paris. And we taught them the Bible. And we started to see lives transformed. We, we started to see the community within a prison impacted for good. Why? Because God is faithful, and, and I responded to a nudge. I, 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 I see this over and over again, not only in the prison ministry in Malawi, but I see it in the ministries of our church, of how often we see incredible things happening because people respond to a nudge. Because what you start to realize is that when you are obedient, when you are faithful to the ways that God is nudging you, you start to realize that God is already at work behind the scenes. Again, look at the story of the Ethiopian. I mean, Philip just walking down a random road, walking up to a random chariot, like what is that all about? It wasn't random. It wasn't coincidence. This man was learning and wanting to know more about who God was. God was already at work in his life. And the very same thing is true in our circles of influence, in your family, in your workplace, in your community. You have no idea what God is already at work at but will you respond to the nudge? And, and the third thing I remind about nudges is that often it pushes us out of our place of comfort and puts us in the places where other people are at. I think, I think one of the dangers for us as a church is that we expect people to come to us, that when they're ready, when they have questions, they'll, they'll, just, they'll just show up. And, and sometimes that happens. But for us being for Paris, being for our communities, means that we go out to them. We get into their spaces. We get into our communities to begin to see how we can make a difference for them. Again, it's like Philip. 
He, he met the Ethiopian where he was at. He, he didn't wait for him to come to where, where Philip was, where he was teaching in Samaria. No, he left Samaria and met him where he was at. And the very same thing, when I got involved in the prison ministry, I didn't think, well, when these men are released, they'll come to church, then I can tell them about Jesus. No, no, we brought Jesus to them in the midst of the prisons. And, and, and we see that time and time again through the various ministries of our church, wanting to get in the spaces of others. Last fall, there was an initiative by, by a few people in our congregation who, who wanted to connect their neighbors, who wanted to be for their community. And so we didn't invite the neighbors to come to our church. We, we had a party in the park. We brought games. We brought pizza. We brought our people to them to bring them together. And, 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 and the question was asked a couple of times, like, like, why are you doing this? It's like, because we want to be for you. We are for our community. And so if a nudge is pushing you out of your comfort zone, in a place to meet people where they're at, it's probably a pretty good indicator that God is prompting you to take a step. So where do we land? What's our, what's our takeaway in the midst of all of this? Continue to remember that as a church, we want to be for pairs. We want to be a church that is for our community. But guess what? It's not about us running programs. It's not about us just simply talking about it. It's about us as individuals getting in the corners of others, beginning to see the ways in which God is nudging us. Last week, Ryan talked about how we want to look at some new initiatives, some, some new exciting opportunities to be reaching our community, to be getting into the space of our community, to bring the good news of Jesus. And we would love to hear from you. And so if you haven't filled out a form or, or, or offered a new suggestion, we would love for you to do that right now to, to give us some ideas to see how can we begin to reach our community to bring good news of Jesus to them. Or maybe there's a way that God is nudging you. Maybe, maybe there's a person that, that, that God is like, hey, listen, listen, like, could you be more intentional with them? Could you be praying for them? Could you be just simply checking in on them? Listen, I believe that God wants us to continue to be his witnesses in the places where we land. But it begins with a nudge of us allowing God to get our attention, to push us in a direction that maybe we would not have gone on our own. And, and don't worry what the outcome may be. Begin to see how God is going to op open opportunities for you. As a church, we're Paris Community Church. We're for Paris because we believe that God is for us and we want to be a church that is for you. And so continue to join us. Continue to, to, to explore who Jesus is and what this means for you. But continue to look for the nudges that God is prompting in your life to begin to see how God will use you to make a difference. Let's pray together. So gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. I give you thanks for the examples uh, that we read in the Bible of Philip and this, this Ethiopian, of, of how it started with a nudge and it brought transformation, not only in this Ethiopian's life, but ultimately to an entire country. Like how, how amazing is that? God, I know that you still want to use us. May we be open and obedient to the nudges that you prompt in our lives. May we step into to places that that maybe we may not have thought of going on our own, but trusting God that you are opening doors. You are creating opportunities for lives to be transformed, for communities to be impacted for good, because we have been faithful and we have showed others the way to you, Jesus. So help us, give us the courage. Holy Spirit, will you continue to nudge and guide? For we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, we're grateful that you, you joined us this week. And may you know God's blessing upon your life today and in your many tomorrows. Have a great rest of your day.